until our knowledge of your love is made perfect in our love for all your children. For your love's sake, we pray. Amen. Amen. So again, welcome. Um, my name is Wes Smedley. We're here at St. Christian's Church in Chicago. I wanna invite uh, Priscilla Reed, one of the leaders in our diocese here in Chicago, a leader on the Peace and Justice Committee of the Episcopal Diocese of Chicago and uh, member and friend here of, of St. Chrysostom's and leader of St. Chrysostom's Church. Priscilla, thank you so much for holding these conversations, inspiring us, and we thank you so, so much to our guests uh, for being here as well. Welcome. You have the floor, Ms. Priscilla. Good evening, and thank you for joining this conversation. Wes has already introduced me. I am a member of this community, also of the Episcopal Peace Fellowship, Palestine Israel Network, and the Diocesan Peace and Justice Committee. I have this, uh, the honor this evening of introducing our speaker, Professor Ayman Shahadi, whom we're extremely fortunate to have with us to provide a brief history of Palestine Israel that will dispel a number of misunderstandings that circulate in this country. A couple of quick housekeeping items before I begin the introduction. This session is being recorded on video. We warmly encourage questions from the audience after the presentation. Those here in the church can come to the microphone right here, the Eagle lectern. Um, I suggest you come around the side rather than through the cords here. You will not appear on camera if you go to the microphone. You might want to know that. Those participating via Zoom can put their questions in the chat to accommodate as many questions as possible, we ask that you try to formulate them briefly. Professor Shahadi is a teacher and academic, an actor, director, and producer for television, theater, and film, founder of Uprising Theater, and an activist and speaker on issues of human rights, including, of course, Palestinian and academic freedom. He is a Palestinian American born in Chicago, currently teaches courses on the Middle East, and uh, Palestine Israel at Columbia College and the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Among many other roles, he produced the Gaza monologues in Chicago and wrote, produced and directed a play about a Palestinian family living under occupation called Garden of the Three. Uprising Theater was established the ampl to amplify the voices of Palestinians and other marginalized groups. A personal experience at Columbia College reflects Ayman Shahadi's longtime commitment to free speech and academic freedom. In the fall of 2013, he showed to a class a film entitled Five Broken Cameras, which was co-directed by a Palestinian and Israeli uh, who documented the weekly protests in the West Bank village of Berlin. Shortly after the film projection, Professor Shahadi was told by the chair of his department that one student in the class had complained of bias in his teaching and pointed to the film as an example, as evidence. The following semester, his course and his contract for teaching two sections were canceled, and the reasons cited were enrollment and rotating curriculum. There ensued what became an international campaign for academic freedom that won the support of the co-directors of the film and the support of the American Association of University Professors. Columbia College was found ultimately guilty of violating academic freedom and Professor Shahadi's course was reinstated. This kind of infringement of free speech and academic freedom is part of a well-organized, well-financed campaign in this country to suppress discussion of Palestinian human rights. This urgent issue was addressed in the resolution titled Freedom of Speech and the Right to Boycott that was passed with overwhelming approval at the annual convention of the Episcopal Diocese of Chicago and an issue we hope to address in a subsequent talk. Misunderstanding and misinformation that circulate widely in this country serve to prolong the conflict in Palestine and Israel and distort US policy. One misguided notion is that this struggle is rooted in the centuries old animosity between Muslims and Jews. Not so. Conflict arose with Jewish nationalism or Zionism, 
in the latter part of the 19th century and with the arrival of European settlers in Palestine. Second, people repeat the tired refrain that describes Israel as, quote, a land without people for a people without land, unquote. In fact, 20th century Palestine was populated by a significant majority of Palestinian Arabs, Christians and Muslims, whose ancestors had lived there for centuries. This notion of empty space has been used as one way to justify the ongoing dispossession of Palestinians. We're very grateful to Professor Shahadi for giving his time so generously to provide a much broader understanding of this struggle. Thank you, uh, Priscilla, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I want to thank the church as well uh, for providing these types of platforms, because uh, in all honesty, these platforms are very rare. And when they do exist, oftentimes uh, they are uh, challenged and there are attempts to get rid of them. So uh, for the church to be doing something like this is, uh, is telling me as uh, an academic, uh, but most importantly, as a, as a Palestinian American, uh, who has worked on this issue for, for a long time that uh, this church and the folks who helped organize this event are on the right side of history. So I wanna thank you all for, for uh, accommodating us uh, this evening. So I have 45 minutes to give you uh, uh, the uh, a history and a background of this crisis. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you sort of a general background um, of some of the most pertinent issues uh, whether it's uh, fact or whether it's ideology, uh, you can supplement this lecture with a uh, very concise paper that is in one of the attachments that I wrote. Uh, it's a policy paper that you can read. Uh, it has uh, many um, links uh, and it's very, very um, precise in terms of the background of this issue. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna start off with uh, discussing uh, Palestine itself and it's sort of the background of the last 400 years. Uh, Palestine has been under the rule of the uh, Ottoman Empire uh, for approximately, there it is, uh, for approximately 400 years. So from 1516 to 1917, uh, the Ottoman Empire officially ruled Palestine. Prior to that, it had been under the rule of uh, one Muslim empire or another uh, back to the seventh century with the exception of a, a couple of centuries when <laughs> Uh, the Crusaders were in Palestine. Uh, the people of Palestine uh, considered themselves in 1917 uh, were uh, predominantly Palestinian Arabs uh, with a majority Muslim population and with a minority Christian population that had existed there since the time of Jesus Christ. And so uh, this is something very important uh, for folks to know, uh, those who are here tonight and those who are listening that the Palestinian people are the first Christians and they, they are the people that gave Christianity to, to humanity. So uh, this is uh, uh, something that uh, a lot of folks don't know, but that's uh, actually the reality. Uh, if we look at the population numbers, and this is one of the most important issues, and Priscilla touched on this briefly, uh, and, uh, but it is one of the most important issues uh, that 97% of the population in Palestine uh, in the late 19th century was Muslim, majority Muslim, with a strong, with a large Christian minority. There were 3%, there was a 3% Jewish population in Palestine. These are Palestinian Jews. These are Jews who are indigenous to Palestine. And so there was really no difference between the Palestinian uh, Muslims that were there, uh, the Christians and the Jews. They all spoke the same language. They babysat each other's children. They were all Palestinian. They shared the same culture. Uh, it wasn't until uh, a, a uh, secular nationalist ideology coming from Europe uh, changed all that. Uh, and that uh, secular ideology is Zionism. And I'm going to uh, touch on that uh, in a little bit. But if you look at the country there, this is, that's Palestine. Collectively, if you include uh, Israel, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip today, uh, it's a very small territory. It's about the size of New Jersey uh, and Delaware, which, is, which are two of the, the smallest states in the, in the union. And so if you, um, if you go a little further there, uh, you can go ahead and click if you can, thank you. Uh, if you look at that there, uh, what you'll see on a map is you can barely see it, it's in the red. 
So it's a very tiny area, but it has captured the hearts and minds of billions of people around the world, primarily because of its religious significance. You have over uh, a billion Christians. Uh, the Muslim Islam is, is uh, uh, almost, is about a billion people as well. You of course have Judaism, which is the oldest of the three Abrahamic religions. Uh, they all uh, consider this place holy. Uh, that in of itself though, can sometimes make people uh, believe that this is somehow a religious issue. It's very important to note that this is a modern secular issue. It is not a religious issue. In fact, the, the Zionists who first came to Palestine in the late 19th century were Jewish, uh, but they were also atheists. Okay, so you could be Jewish, uh, but uh, you don't necessarily have to be practicing religion because it can be an ethno-religious or even a cultural identity. Uh, so uh, looking at the rise of Zionism, so you have Palestine under the rule of the, the Ottoman Empire. It's been there for 400 years. And then there is a, an ideology that begins to take hold in Europe. And it, uh, uh, it is sparked by uh, the French Revolution of 1789. People often think about Mary Antoinette and, and her saying, let them eat cake and the king's head getting chopped off and all those things. But the reality is what, what the important thing about the French Revolution is, is that it gave rise to what is called nationalism. And it brought down the old order or the feudal system. And so what countries started to do basically is they started to organize themselves in a way in accordance with, with a so-called ethnicity or with a so-called language. Um, uh, and this, this, by the way, was oftentimes made up. Uh, nationalism in of itself is, 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 a, is sort of a is very formulaic. There was a famous Italian who once said that we have uh, created Italy, but now we have to create Italians. So, so it is very formulaic, and this idea uh, begins to replace the old order. It took about 150 years up to World War I, uh, where empires were falling, whether it's the Austro-Hungarian Empire, whether it's the Ottoman Empire, and other empires that begin to fall, and uh, nation states begin to rise in the ashes of those failed um, uh, 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 empires. Now, there were Jewish communities throughout Europe, uh, there were Jews in Western Europe and Central and Eastern Europe. And depending on where you were uh, as a, a Jew, um, it, life for you may have been better or may have been worse. For example, if you were in the Western part of Europe, in Britain and France and other areas, the ideas of the Enlightenment um, and other revolutions that happened in the Western part of Europe allowed Jews to assimilate in those countries. Things weren't perfect for them, but the last few centuries were better than say Eastern Europe where pogroms con continued. Uh, there was an area called the Pale of Settlement where Jews were, were put in uh, in the uh, late 18th century uh, just for being Jewish. And this is uh, amplified by the rise of nationalism because in many cases, many of these Jews in these communities did not fit the nationalist mold that was rising in these areas. So Jewish leaders thought, well, how about a Jewish state? Uh, primarily to counter the anti-Jewish sentiment or what is referred to as anti-Semitism, although Palestinians are also, also Semites as well. Uh, but that reference to that term anti-Semitic in order to counter the anti-Semitism that had existed in Europe, the idea was to create a Jewish state. And so different places were, were talked about as far as this Jewish state uh, is concerned from places from Argentina uh, to places in Africa, to places in Europe, uh, but Palestine, because of its religious uh, significance, began to become popular amongst uh, Jewish communities in Europe. Although Jewish communities were also divided on the idea of Zionism in a Jewish state, because in the Eastern part of Europe, they were more enthusiastic about it because uh, of the oppression that, ex that existed there. In Western Europe, people were worried that uh, the centuries that uh, uh, Jewish communities had uh, gained in terms of progress uh, would be curtailed because uh, some people thought that the idea of going to another place would other them. And so they would lose the fact that they were British or the fact that they were French or what have you in order to go uh, to uh, this, new, this, this new state. So Zionism representing itself as a political movement uh, with the primary objective of establishing a Jewish state. Now, what does a Jewish, how do you establish a Jewish state? Well, 
you need a majority Jewish population. That's how you establish a majority Jewish state. Uh, and uh, after uh, some debate, not much debate, but some debate on the part of uh, some Zionist leaders, such as uh, Theodor Herzl, uh, the idea of Palestine being a, uh, uh, a state for Jews was the one that was um, uh, discussed. Can you go back to that, that uh, just a quick back? That uh, map there I put there just to show you uh, all what nationalism did. So if you go prior to, to World War I, if you go back to the 19th century, you see the way that the world was sort of set up. You had a, a lot of empires, but look at the 20th century. You have dozens upon dozens of different countries. Look at Africa, look at Europe. Uh, there is this idea uh, that we hear all the time about the Palestinians, that, that there was never a Palestinian state and there's no such thing as Palestinians. But the idea is, is that uh, there was no Palestinian state because um, the state of Israel was created in its place. Um, but nationalism itself is a relatively new concept. In fact, if you look at Africa, uh, some of these countries in Africa weren't created until the mid 20th century. And so Nigeria was created in the mid 20th century. It doesn't mean there weren't any Nigerians prior to the creation of Nigeria in the mid 20th century. It's just that it organized as a state in accordance with European ideas and European modes because Europeans sort of set the bar as to what constitutes a people and what does not constitute a people. I can tell you for sure that the Palestinians are some of the oldest people on their habit, in their habitat of Palestine, of all the people in the world, they've been there for thousands of years and they're the product of all the civilizations uh, that have come and gone there uh, over the course of time. And so the idea was to establish a majority Jewish state in Palestine. Um, and uh, um, we know uh, the reason why it's a secular movement. I think that's very important to remember that this is not a uh, religious movement. There were Jews who, who moved to Palestine uh, later on. Uh, there are Jews who live in, in uh, Israel today who justify their presence in say uh, Israeli settlements or what have you or on the land uh, by this idea that, that there's some sort of religious connection or what have you. But at its, as, at its foundation, Zionism is a secular movement uh, in, in a, a, a Jewish nationalist movement. Uh, so, if you're going to remember anything from this discussion tonight, I think this slide says it all. This is the most important slide or, or, or the most important idea that you can understand about this issue, which is that Zionism is an ideology whose followers advocate for the creation and the maintenance of a majority Jewish state. Fine. And we know why. We just gave you examples why. Uh, there was anti-Semitism. It, it was the nationalism of the age and what have you. Here's where the problem lies. It's on a territory where the majority of the population is not Jewish. 97% of the population that lived in Palestine when Zionism began to have its designs on the country was not Jewish. And so the question is, what does a Jewish state mean for the people of Palestine? What does it mean? Well, I think that the answer is very apparent. It's meant uh, dispossession as has been uh, shown. Uh, and from 1947 uh, all the way till today. Uh, it's also meant ethnic cleansing as well, because the mere fact that you are not Jewish in the country um, makes you a threat to, the, to, to this ideology, which seeks a majority Jewish state. You cannot be a state without being a majority. So we oftentimes hear about Hamas, or we hear about uh, Palestinian resistance, or uh, what's referred to as Palestinian terrorism as a source of the issue. Hamas is not the cause of the apartheid. Hamas is the result of the apartheid. And so there is a system that was put in place that is designed to oppress an entire population of people. And that system began in the late 19th century and it continues to exist today in different forms. If you wanna know why there are settlements, it's because Zionism is an ideology whose followers advocate for the creation and the maintenance now of a majority Jewish state on a territory where the majority isn't Jewish. If you wanna know why there's a wall there uh, that surrounds po Palestinian population centers, it's because of that objective, which is to maintain a majority Jewish state. And that's sort of the, the paradox that the state of Israel has today, which is that it, it's trying to um, figure out a way to make the Palestinians disappear. Uh, in, in 1948, they were ethnically cleansed in the country, from the country, but now it's, it's, it's 
there's a gradual ethnic cleansing, but not a dramatic one like you saw in 48 and some of that in 67. So uh, you have walls that are being built to push Palestinians aside as if they don't exist. Uh, and, uh, and it's all as a result of this uh, statement here, which I cannot emphasize uh, enough, is, is, the, is, is something that uh, hopefully you'll take away with you tonight, uh, having a solid grasp of. Thank you. Uh, so if we look at uh, 1919, now the Zionist project had existed prior to that. There were people coming into the country uh, prior to the takeover of the British, which is in 1917. Uh, but even up until 1919, you had uh, over half a million Palestinians and you had an immigration into the country that was rising, 65,000 Jews uh, who were mostly immigrants uh, coming in from Europe. And the objective is to create this uh, Jewish state. Now, World War I is, is the key uh, here because in World War I, uh, the Ottoman Empire officially is on the losing side and it it doesn't disintegrate and in, 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 uh, officially over until 1924, but its provinces are lost. Uh, Palestine, that's Transjordan at the time, that's Iraq. That, those went to the, to the victors, so they went to the British. Uh, Syria, Lebanon went to the French. And so it's, it's, it's divvying up uh, and, and practicing imperialism <coughs> at its height, basically. And so uh, in keeping with the British promise, uh, in the Balfour Declaration, which I believe is coming up next, uh, the idea was to help the Zionist movement build the institutions and the infrastructure to create a future Jewish state. So the Zionist movement, which was formidable, it's coming from Europe. And Europe in the last 400 years um, uh, had gone through unprecedented development, which culminated in the social revolutions of the, of the French Revolution, as well as uh, the industrial revolution. So they had the technology, they had the social power, they had the ideology, which was Zionism, which was, which was very unifying. Uh, they had a secular mindset, a uh, very scientific mindset, secular mindset, and they brought those ideas to Palestine. Uh, but could they have done it by themselves, despite the fact that they were formidable? The answer is absolutely not. The British, which, were, which was a superpower at that time, it's, it's comparable to what the United States uh, is today, help the, the uh, Zionist movement build the institutions and the infrastructure to create the modern state of Israel. So from the very beginning, you see that objective embodied uh, in the Balfour Declaration. And there it is, that's the Balfour Declaration, which very short, but essentially uh, it is uh, written uh, from uh, Arthur Balfour to Lord Rothschild, who was a, a Zionist leader at the time. And the promise is to build the, uh, help uh, the Zionist movement build the institutions and the infrastructure to create a Jewish state with the promise in the Balfour Declaration that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the rights of the Palestinians, the civil and religious rights of the Palestinians. But this declaration never mentioned political rights. So from its very get-go, this uh, declaration has a series uh, of contradictions, one of which is how do you um, create a Jewish state in the country when the uh, population in the country is the minority in the country at the time. Uh, that's A. B, how do you deny the majority of the population political rights? How do you do that? Where did that exist also in the 20th century? It actually began in 1948, where an entire group of people, uh, the majority, the great majority of the population was denied political rights. It was in South Africa under the, the, the apartheid uh, era. And it's not until uh, this year, by the way, that Human Rights Watch and Beit Salaam have come out and finally said with what we've been saying for years, which is the state of Israel practices apartheid. And that right there is the source of it, as far as the Balfour Declaration is concerned. This document is, is uh, monumental for Zionism because what it does is it officializes it. Uh, you have a superpower supporting it, uh, but there is no mention of the political rights of the Palestinians. In fact, where are the Palestinians? Why weren't the Palestinians who were the majority of the population at the time? Why weren't they? Um, uh, why wasn't anyone present? Why didn't the, they uh, acknowledge the Palestinian presence uh, in Palestine? And it's very similar to what they, what they do today. I mean, if you look at uh, uh, the uh, so-called deal, deal of the century under, under Donald Trump a couple of years ago, 
you had Jared Kushner there, you had the Israeli ambassador to the uh, uh, United States, you had the US ambassador to the, to the state of Israel, but you had no Palestinians. I mean, this is something, there's a, there's a thread here that you can see uh, that dates back uh, to this particular era here. Uh, so briefly, why did Britain support Zionism? Well, it had World War I interest. If you look at uh, the map there, uh, you can see that there's a Suez Canal. Uh, Britain thought that Palestine would be a buffer uh, from uh, other empires like the French and the Ottomans and so forth. So they, they saw Palestine as a potential buffer. Uh, there's the issue of, of the Bolshevik Revolution. Russia wanted to get out of the war. So uh, the idea was to try to convince the Bolshevik Revolution. There was a stereotype about the Bolsheviks that they were, um, that it was somehow a Jewish revolution and the idea of establishing a Jewish state uh, would convince the Bolsheviks to stay in the war. Uh, there were um, uh, other aspects. Uh, there were British uh, uh, Jews who were in, in, uh, in Britain who advocated for, for Zionism like uh, Lord Rothschild. There's also Christian Zionism as well, which advocates, which, which believes that in order for Jesus Christ to return, that um, the state of Israel has to exist as a, as a national entity, as if there was nationalism around a couple of thousand years ago. Uh, but these are, uh, these are reasons, especially with Christian Zionism, that are, are very prominent here in the United States today. One of the reasons why uh, the U.S. is a staunch supporter of Israel is related to this idea of Christian Zionism and the, uh, the return of the uh, Messiah and so forth. Ignoring the fact that uh, not only is there a Palestinian population that is Christian, but that uh, Palestinians are the first Christians as well. So Zionist objectives are to uh, do two things. You need a majority Jewish state that the country doesn't have a, a Jewish population or a small Jewish population. So what do you do? You, you bring in uh, uh, immigration into the country, primarily coming from Europe in the beginning. Uh, the second aspect is you need land. You need to get your hands on land as well. And so uh, with the help of the British, uh, the Zionists were able to uh, get their hands on land. There were some Palestinians who did sell their land to Zionists, however, on the eve of the creation of the state of Israel, only 6% of the country was controlled by the Zionist movement. And uh, the population of the country was only 30% Jewish. This is something also very, very important uh, to remember. And I'm going to emphasize this again. On the eve of the creation of the state of Israel, only 6% of the country was owned by the Zionist movement. And only 30% of the population was Jewish, mostly European immigrants. A few months later, over 80% of the population was Jewish. And over 80%, or approximately 80% of the country, uh, of the land of the country was controlled by the new state of Israel. So how did it jump in population and in land like that within a matter of a few months? Throughout decades, the idea was to purchase land. Throughout decades, the idea was to, to immigrate. Uh, but the Jewish majority, which is the objective of Zionism, was never reached by that type of engineering. And so how did it happen that the majority became a majority within a few months? Well, if you can't bring in the population, you could get rid of the unwanted population. And that's what happened uh, beginning in November of 1947 all the way through 1948 with the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. There's a great book by an author by the name of Ilan Pape. He's an Israeli author. Um, so sometimes, unfortunately, uh, the, the uh, Palestinian um, word is not taken into consideration. These are Israeli authors that went into the archives after these, the archives were allowed to, uh, to be researched. And uh, authors like Ilan Pape found that Israel conducted a deliberate operation called Operation Plan Delay or Operation Plan D, which was the blueprint for the ethnic cleansing of, of Palestine. That's a war crime. You can't ethnically cleanse populations. It's a war crime when you deliberately engineer the removal of one particular group. So um, I think that that statement uh, that's in quotes right there, which is uh, uh, from Theodore Herzl, 
in his uh, document, Der Judenstaat, uh, which is the Jewish state, where he's arguing why there should be a Jewish state uh, to the Ottoman Empire at the time and to other uh, European empires as well. And I quote, we should there form a part of a wall of defense for Europe and Asia, an outpost of civilization against barbarism. Okay, so this is, this is how the, uh, uh, the continent of Europe thought of, not just of the Palestinians at the time, but of all people of color, color. whether you're, you're uh, if you look at some of the literature uh, about uh, uh, folks from Africa or people from Asia and other places, the indigenous populations here, uh, the rhetoric about them is uh, openly racist. Today, it's, uh, it's a little bit covered, although in the previous administration, it came out much more, right? But it's a little bit, uh, it's presented a little bit cuter today. But back there, it was okay. Back then, it was okay to call non-Europeans barbarians and so forth. And this will sort of give you an idea about the attitude that the Zionist movement is coming with to Palestine along with their formidable development, along with their technology, along with their, with their ideology and their secular mindset, and their atheist mindset. Uh, they're coming with this belief that these folks who live in Palestine uh, are, are, are inferior. And that this is something that the Palestinians have lived with since the coming, since the advent of Zionism in Palestine. Now, when you add the British equation to that, uh, the Palestinians uh, who, um, were, were not part of those European developments, never had the technology, never had the development. Uh, and although they fought, or they tried to fight, uh, could not withstand uh, this uh, uh, formidable ideology along with the help of Western powers, especially that of Great Britain. Uh, you can uh, move on with that, thank you. Uh, so uh, if we look at the period between 1933 uh, immediately after 1933 to 1935. Uh, something happens in Europe, which, which plays a very important role in terms of the Jewish population in Europe, as well as the, uh, the population in Palestine. Between 33 and 35, the, po the Jewish population in Palestine doubles. And that's as a result of the rise of Adolf Hitler. Uh, he, he comes to power in 1933. He begins to consolidate it, begins to uh, take hold and become the sole uh, ruler, dictator over there. And what he does is he immediately uh, starts trying to fulfill the promises that he made and the ideas that he had in some of the, the, the rhetoric that he uh, spewed, as well as in, in some of the books like Mein Kempf that he wrote. And so he began to, to purge minorities um, and, and the Jews in Germany. And so uh, the Holocaust, which, which begins after 1941, there's a period of years before that where Jews in, Euro in Germany and then in Europe following uh, World War II were uh, subjected to confiscation of property, uh, where they were subjected to the denial of citizenship. And when they were, they were moved from uh, their neighborhoods uh, from one area to another, put in concentration camps. And it wasn't until 1941 when the final solution uh, took place where uh, Jews began to be put uh, uh, to death. And because the Nazi party uh, advanced not only in Germany, but throughout continental Europe, that's why the death toll was so high, because they implemented those same types of plans, not only in Germany, but in the rest of Europe. And so the loss of uh, 6 million Jews, along with millions of Slavs, uh, hundreds of thousands of gypsies and others uh, that who were um, thought of as uh, unwanted by the uh, Nazi regime and uh, their ideology. And so uh, the population in Palestine doubles. And this is sort of one of the, this is one of the, the many tragedies here is you have uh, many of the, the, the Jewish populations from Europe coming into Palestine, not necessarily driven by ideology, wanting to, to, to as pioneers as, as they referred to themselves uh, or ad, uh, um, advocates of Zionism for the sole purpose of the ideology, but they needed somebody, somewhere to go because they were um, in danger. They were fleeing their, their areas because of persecution and so forth. Well, for the Palestinians who were there, uh, there was more friction between the, the, uh, the new Jewish immigrants who were still giving, uh, given favor by the British uh, and uh, thus the Palestinians were subjected to uh, more loss of land and issues and so forth. 
you can look at, when you look at that map, you can see where uh, early Jewish immigration was. And if you look at the state of Israel today, much of Israel's population is actually there on the, in the north and in the, in the western co coast there in Tel Aviv and Haifa and Yaffa. Uh, Haifa and Yaffa, of course, are two uh, Palestinian uh, majority uh, cities that were ethnically cleansed in 1948. Thank you. So we move on to uh, the end of World War II. Uh, the British, which had been waging war on humanity for the last 500 years, uh, finally decided to uh, give up on Palestine. They had lost their uh, possessions in India uh, and in the, in the East uh, and didn't see Palestine as a, a needed buffer zone anymore. Uh, the empire was, had crumbled as a result of uh, World War II. And it's something uh, uh, important to remember about Europe is that it, nobody else could defeat Europe but Europeans. And so it is because Europeans went to war with each other and took the world uh, with them uh, that uh, these countries and these powers were destroyed. And so they had to give up their, their empire. What did they do? They gave the uh, Palestine mandate uh, over to the United Nations. And the United Nations came up with this idea here. Uh, and those are the population numbers at that point uh, in time. You can see that uh, the uh, Palestinians number 1.3 million people. Uh, the Jewish immigrants are over 600,000. The Zionist movement owns 6% of the land. They were giving 54% of the land according to this partition plan, uh, despite the fact that they were less than a third of the population. Uh, they were given the most fertile land uh, and the Palestinians who were on the, uh, the, the Jewish side of the, of the partition plan were worried about their uh, uh, positions in the country, uh, living either as inferior or being removed from the country. And so uh, after November of 1947, uh, the partition plan there, which was supposed to be subject to the agreement of the majority of the population, the Palestinians were never uh, given a vote to partition their country or the majority or the population in the country was never given a vote. In the same way, for example, as Quebec was given uh, a vote as to if they wanted to leave Canada or not, or Scotland, or even uh, Puerto Rico, although there's a lot of oppression going on over there. Uh, so, so the Palestinians were never given a vote. This is a general UN General Assembly resolution. It's not a Security Council resolution. So it's not, it's not binding, but the Zionist movement took it as a, um, a, a wink for a state, basically. The following day, the following day, after the UN partition plan, the first Palestinian village was ethnically cleansed. And prior to the creation of the state of Israel, uh, May 14th, 1948, the following day is when the Arab armies from the area supposedly invaded, 300,000 Palestinians had already been ethnically cleansed from the country. There is this idea that Israel was defending itself from the Arab armies and thus the Palestinians uh, had, uh, were caught in the war and some left and so forth. That's not true. The Palestinians never had a militia in the, or never had an army in the country. And so they were pretty much defenseless. And so 300,000 Palestinians prior to any Arab army coming into uh, the new state of Israel had already been picked off and ethnically cleansed. One of those villages, and this is sort of in the hearts and minds of all Palestinians, anybody who is uh, in their 90s and anybody who's a, a, a child knows about the massacre of Deir Yassin, which is a massacre that occurred April 9th, 1948, where 200 Palestinians were murdered in their villages. They were unarmed. Uh, and uh, what this did was, this was advertised around the country that if you don't leave, the same thing will happen to you. This, along with other villages, began to cause the flight of Palestinians. Uh, and uh, many wound up in uh, refugee camps uh, that still exist today. Uh, and this is referred to as psychological warfare because there's a difference between a war happening and people going to, to places to seek shelter uh, as opposed to uh, a blueprint to ethnically cleanse the population. That constitute a war crime. And so the Palestinians charge that the new state of Israel, it wasn't the state of Israel at that time, it was about a month before, 
uh, conducted a blueprint. And that blueprint is called Operation Plan Delet, Operation Plan D for the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. If you want more information about that particular massacre uh, and that uh, operation, uh, you should read a book by Ilan Pape called The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. He's the Israeli author uh, that I referred to. to. And so uh, the populations that were expelled were 750,000 to 1 million people. Um, Israel denies that there was an ethnic cleansing. And they said that this population was hostile and, and this is as a result of war uh, and so forth. Uh, but you can tell by Israel's behavior towards these refugees that it was indeed an ethnic cleansing. So the population was removed in 1948. There are two other elements to ethnic cleansing. The second, which is uh, you make sure the population doesn't return. So there are no Palestine. If you left Palestine or if you were forced out of the area in 19, from 1947 through 1948, you can't return. Despite the fact that UN resolution 194 calls for the right of the return of Palestinians. So Israel refuses to allow the Palestinians, allow the Palestinians to return at that time, and it refuses to allow uh, the Palestinians uh, to uh, return today because the Jewish majority was finally reached. Uh, and they, they got 80% uh, percent or controlled 80% of the land. That third element there is what is referred to as memoricide. So what Israel did once it took the territory is it began to erase the names of the villages uh, and, and change those names to Hebrew in the streets. It burned the books of Palestinian authors. It destroyed Palestinian libraries. It tried to destroy Palestinian culture either by erasing it or by appropriating it. And you, you still see that uh, even uh, to this day. So one of the ways in which Israel uh, maintains a majority, so it got the majority by the removal of the population, but one of the ways that it maintains a majority is through this idea of the law of return. Now notice the term return that these people who are happen to be Jewish, and I, I believe it's a grandmother or a grandfather that, that must be Jewish in order for uh, you to be able to come back and become a citizen. And this is called returning, despite the fact that there is no connection between this land and these immigrants that are coming from anywhere from Australia, Arkansas, Peru, uh, France, they're coming from all over the place, right? And, and somehow this is a return uh, to this area where you can gain citizenship in order to maintain that majority in the same way that I've been referencing it. So, so create and maintain a Jewish majority. The Palestinian refugees, of course, are not allowed to return uh, on, as stipulated under Resolution 194, which is a UN resolution. There's something also called the absentee law of November 29th, 1947. This is also very important because when the Palestinians left, they also left their land, they left their properties, they left their, their there, were, there, were, uh, there are pictures and photos out there of, of um, still things still cooking in the oven. Uh, and there are, there are pictures out there of, of people um, so scared that they're, they're, they're carrying their luggage and, and um, not being able to fill their, their luggage with, with all their goods and so forth. Uh, and so people left so quickly, they left everything behind, left all their homes. Most of those homes today are occupied by the, the, the immigrants that came from Europe. And um, I have a, a good friend of mine who just did a, a documentary on that, a film, her father went back uh, to uh, what is now Israel and knocked on the door of the home of his dad. He was five when he was uh, removed and, uh, and he's a French, uh, uh, an Israeli of French descent came out and asked them what he was doing on his property. So that absentee law of November 29th, 1947 means that if you left your property on that day, which is the day of the partition plan, you have no rights to it. The state of Israel confiscated that property. That's how Israel uh, navigated in, 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 in having control of 6% of the land to having control of over 80% of the land within a matter of a few months by creating laws such as these. So hundreds of thousands of refugees, uh, loss of homes, and today there are over uh, 5 million refugees. These are the refugees that are registered with UNRWA, by the way. These are not the total number of refugees that are registered refugees uh, with uh, UNRWA. And those right there, by the way, that if you look at that green area, 
That is the official border of the state of Israel. So those are the official borders of the state of Israel. Now remember that map there, those are the official borders. So if you go to the United Nations, you wanna look at what is recognized by the UN as the official borders of the state of Israel, it would be that. Although Israel is the only country in the world that has not declared its borders as of yet. And I'll show you guys why in a second. So moving up to 1967. Uh, so for 20 years, there were a series of, of skirmishes and, and uh, wars between Israel and its Arab neighbors in 1967. Uh, the Six-Day War broke out, and uh, Israel calls it a preemptive strike, like we call attacking Iraq a, a preemptive strike. Uh, and in six days, what it did was it managed to conquer and quadruple the territory that it controls. So it took over the Sinai Peninsula, it took over the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and it took over the Golan Heights in the north there. And so uh, another 250,000 Palestinians were displaced. However, this time it's different. This time Israel not only inherited the land, but it also inherited over 1 million Palestinians as well. And so now Israel is in a paradox. How do you control the land which it, it, it wants to have control of, yet what to do with the over 1 million Palestinians. And so it came up with uh, a, a bunch of interesting ways to try and maintain its majority Jewish state and still have control of the territory. By the way, uh, the Sinai Peninsula was given back to uh, Egypt uh, in a peace treaty that still holds today. And the Golan Heights was annexed by uh, uh, Israel uh, in 1980. And it was recognized by Donald Trump a couple of years ago, East Jerusalem. Uh, if you look at Jerusalem there, the reason why uh, the international community does not recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel is because Israel took control of uh, West Jerusalem in 1948. It took control of, of East Jerusalem in 1967. But under international law, you cannot admit territory into your own country that you won through war, that you conquered through war. So let's just say we want to go take Canada and, and, and conquer Ontario uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, we can, we will go, we'll occupy Toronto, but the international community will not recognize American sovereignty in Toronto because you cannot admit territory that you won through war. And so that's why East Jerusalem is not recognized by the majority of the world community as the capital of Israel because it was won through war in 1967. It is not considered a part of Israel. It's considered occupied territory. However, Israel does not deem these territories or its official policy is, is that these territories are not necessarily occupied, but they are disputed. Not occupied, but they're disputed. And what Israel has begun to do since 1967, the first settlement was in 1968, was to build Jewish only settlements in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. And it's all based, and so the international community says you're committing war crimes because settlement building uh, and trying to replace the demographic and to make it more Jewish in the country, in the, in the West Bank, is, uh, is a war crime. Israel says, no, this is not a war crime because these territories are disputed. And it is all because of the word the that was omitted in UN Resolution 242. So take a look at that statement right there, uh, withdrawal of Israeli armed forces from the territories occupied in the recent conflict. Israel did not want to sign on to that resolution that was uh, put out immediately after the Six Day War, unless the word the was omitted. So the, res the resolution officially reads withdrawal of Israeli armed forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict. So Israel's interpretation according to that is, is we can withdraw from territories that we want to withdraw from. And we did, we withdrew from the Sinai Peninsula, we withdrew from um, uh, other places and so forth. So this does not necessarily mean we should withdraw from all of the territories. So based on that, Israel believes that he can build settlements in violation of, of international law. Well, here's what international law has to say about that. Uh, Article four of the Fourth Geneva Convention uh, says that the occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies. The reason why the Fourth Geneva Convention came out was as a result of what happened during World War II, which is when countries like Nazi Germany would clear the eastern uh, uh, part of uh, eastern parts of Europe from the from Poles and from Jews and from others 
and replace that population with German settlers. So after uh, the end of World War II, what the international community said was, you can, if you occupy a territory, you're not, you can't admit it into your own, A, and B, you can't change the demographic of that territory to the demographic that you want because that is a war crime. And so the international community is saying that this uh, um, resolution applies to the West Bank. And those dots, by the way, those are the Israeli settlements. And that's been one of the, huge, the biggest problems with the two-state solution is, is where do you put the, the second state, which is supposed to be in the West Bank? Because the, the, the landscape is dotted with uh, settlements throughout approximately uh, 620,000 settlers uh, live in that area today. And so UN resolution of 465 makes things very clear. Uh, it basically states that all measures taken by Israel that change the character, demographic composition, uh, has no legal validity, and it violates the Fourth Geneva Convention. And that, of course, also includes uh, East Jerusalem. In 2016, this is probably the only thing that Barack Obama did uh, for, for some reason, people thought that he was uh, uh, pro-Palestinian. What he actually did, or pro-Palestinian rights, what he actually did was he, he uh, told uh, his ambassador at the United Nations not to veto a resolution because the United States could, since they're one of the five Security Council members, and Resolution 2334, which reaffirms that Israel, Israel's settlement building is illegal under international law. In fact, the International Criminal Court of Justice ruled that uh, settlement building is actually a war crime. You could read more about that in the statement that um, you were sent uh, that I wrote in the, in the attachments. Uh, the two-state solution. Uh, so the two-state solution in 1993, uh, there was a, uh, a signing of what are called the Oslo Accords, which were signed between Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization, which today uh, runs, has some sort of autonomy in parts of the West Bank. And the idea was a land for peace, uh, the land for peace concept, which is similar to the land for peace concept that occurred between Egypt, or the premises similar to the land for peace concept, similar to that of uh, Egypt. And uh, the West Bank was divided into three areas, area A, area B, and area C. Area A is where the majority of Palestinian cities are. So the Palestinian, the PLO, uh, developed an organization called the Palestinian Authority, which was which is allowed today some type of autonomy in the area that is called A. So they have security control internally, and they also have civil control. So they can, you know, sweep the garbage in the streets. They can change the light bulbs in the uh, uh, in their uh, uh, streets. They run their schools and so forth. Area B is Palestinian civil control. So they're also allowed to do those things and have their own um, uh, public officials like mayors and so forth. Uh, but uh, Israel retains security control. Area C is full Israeli security control and civil control. In fact, Palestinians from area A and B are not allowed into C. Area C are where all of the settlements are, okay? So those little creases, if you look at those creases, uh, those are where the settlements are. They're, they're basically dotted everywhere. Uh, and what was supposed to happen in the Oslo Accords is over the course of five years, there was supposed to be a transfer of Area C to the Palestinians, hence creating a Palestinian state. That's never happened. In fact, the number of settlers has uh, quadrupled. It was about 150,000 at the time. Today, there are over 620,000 settlers when you include the West Bank uh, and East Jerusalem. Uh, there was a, uh, a speech by uh, the just deposed Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, who was a Prime Minister for quite a while, and he came to, to Congress in 2011 and with overwhelming U.S. congressional support. He got something like 30 standing ovations. Just watching that was uh, very puzzling to me as an American. He got over 30 standing ovations for, for saying that the uh, annexation of Jerusalem will remain that the settlements will continue, that Palestinians have no right to return, uh, that uh, even went as far as saying that there is no occupation in uh, Palestine. And so the majority today, uh, the, the, the ruling powers in, in Israel, uh, as exampled by uh, Naftali Bennett, who's the current prime minister of the state of Israel, 
This guy is a former settler leader. Uh, he has come out flat even more right of Netanyahu and said there will not be uh, a Palestinian state, that there will not, that the settlements will continue, that this whole thing, uh, this whole experiment that's been going on over there uh, will not uh, change or uh, reform itself. This is the Likud charter here. This is the largest party in the state of Israel. Uh, this is the, the party of Benjamin Netanyahu. And you can see it clear, it's in their charter that the idea of establishing a Palestinian state under the guise of the two-state solution is something that we're way past at this point. It's not going to happen. The settlements are everywhere. Uh, the West Bank economy has been interlinked with uh, that of Israel. Uh, the uh, settlers themselves have grown extremely powerful in the last uh, couple of decades. And so establishing a Palestinian state uh, is near impossible at this point. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's the idea of perpetual occupation there. He's the uh, settlement leader. I don't know how much time we have, but... Uh, okay, so uh, what of these... So, so even if the state of Israel wanted to establish, uh, help establish a state, what Israeli politician would want to take that on? There are over 620,000 settlers in Israel today, and they are very powerful. Uh, and many government leaders, many people in the army are actually settlers. And so uh, at this point in time, it seems that Israel may actually risk a civil war if they would try to uh, separate the West Bank from the uh, rest of Israel. And what politician would want to take on this responsibility? Itzhak Rabin, who was assassinated for even discussing the idea of a, a two-state solution uh, by allowing uh, the Palestinian Authority to have some sort of uh, presence in uh, Area A was uh, assassinated for, for his idea. So uh, on that note, I think it's important to start taking a look at this issue as not as, a, uh, as an issue that will be solved uh, if there are two states, uh, because we're way past that at this point. We've been past that for a long time. But looking at this issue as one single state and looking at how the people in the country actually live, one particular group, uh, Israeli Jews have all the rights that are derivative of the state that rules over them. The Palestinians, uh, especially those who live in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, have no civil rights. They have no political rights. They have no right to vote. Uh, they are treated uh, as, I can't even say the word second class because they, they're not in a class. They don't have any rights whatsoever. They're ruled by uh, military law and life for them in the country is very difficult. And so one can only imagine if we live in a country where one group of people, because of the color of their skin, don't have any voting rights or political rights uh, or uh, uh, even economic rights, uh, as opposed to the, the rest of the population. I think we've gone through that here in the United States and other places around the world. And it's called racism and it's called apartheid. So the two state solution also does not address the two subgroups, the three subgroups. You have the refugees outside of the borders of Israel. Uh, you have the Palestinians who live in the state of Israel, who managed not to get themselves removed in 1948. So there are Palestinians who live in the state of Israel today, uh, who are officially citizens. They are about 20% of the population. And they also face a series of laws uh, that are discriminatory that make their life difficult. Uh, and then, of course, there are the Palestinians who live in the West Bank and, and in the Gaza Strip. If there was a, a so-called two-state solution that would um, uh, be manageable for the Palestinians, it would only address the Palestinians who live in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The majority of the Palestinians actually live, don't live in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. They live outside of the borders of the state of Israel, and they also live uh, as, as uh, um, citizens, albeit second class inside of the state of Israel. So um, as far as the refugee situation there, there are people uh, at this point who were born and have died as refugees, despite the fact that their properties, uh, that they have a right to their property, despite the fact that they have a right to return to their homes. Um, they, they are uh, never discussed in the uh, two state paradigm, which in any case, as a result of the settlement building is uh, dead at this point. So uh, in looking at the way that the state of Israel treats uh, its populations based on where they are in the country, uh, if you are in Israel, if you are a Palestinian citizen of Israel, there are land laws, immigration uh, and citizenship laws. 
Uh, there are uh, government uh, participation laws. Uh, there are um, uh, laws that uh, prevent you from uh, gaining uh, certain types of benefits because the majority of Palestinians don't serve in the military. Uh, there is also a wide range of uh, range of civil rights abuses, and there's daily harassment, daily racist harassment that is commonplace uh, in the state of Israel. Uh, for example, land laws inside of the state of Israel are limited to Palestinians are limited to only uh, five percent of the rural lands of the state of Israel and only allowed to live in cities. This is there's no law that basically says that, but because. Uh, when Israel confiscated much of the territory, it only sells land to Jewish Israelis, making it difficult for Palestinians to be able to purchase land and expand their own villages and their own cities. Uh, there are immigration laws. If you're a Palestinian uh, citizen of Israel, and if you want to marry someone from the West Bank, you can't bring them to Israel because, again, it's all about Jewish uh, demography. It's all about sustaining a majority Jewish state. Uh, and so you're not be able to, be, uh, to, to bring your spouse uh, into the country. Um, and there's uh, government participation, making it very difficult because Zionist organizations that founded the state of Israel uh, prioritize Israeli Jews over uh, Palestinians. Go ahead. Uh, if you criticize Israel as a Jewish state, that can pose a dilemma for you, inhibition of freedom of speech. There's a, a law called the Nakba law, which uh, goes after organizations that uh, discuss the Nakba law, which is the, uh, the Nakba is a catastrophe, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 1948. And there's also inhibition of freedom of association. Um, Israel's policies in the West Bank are consistent with apartheid South Africa. And so when you look at imposition of inhumane living conditions, society-wide legalized discrimination, isolating the victim group geographically, exploitation of labor, although there is no slavery in the uh, West Bank officially, uh, inhumane suppression of rebellion against apartheid, these are all elements of apartheid that can be applied to the Palestinian territories that occurred in South Africa. In fact, Desmond Tutu, who was a, uh, who is a, a, an anti-apartheid leader, when he went to Palestine, he said the apartheid that exists there is much worse than we've seen in South Africa. Um, and the definition of apartheid refers to the implementation and maintenance of a system of legalized racial segregation in which one racial group is deprived of political and civil rights. And apartheid is a crime against humanity uh, that we saw in South Africa uh, and that we see in the state of Israel. It is extremely unfortunate that even progressives, so-called progressives here in the United States who um, uh, present themselves as leaning towards the Palestinian cause actually um, contribute to the oppression of Palestinians. US aid to Palestinians is often conditioned on Palestinians not going to the international criminal court. And so, um, if you, the, the, the United States uh, allocates funds to the Palestinian Authority to help run those autonomous areas. And what they do is, is they condition that aid that if the Palestinians seek justice in international uh, courts, uh, international criminal court of justice, that they can lose those funds. And that's the example down there. If you read that, uh, it, it, this was uh, resolu HR resolution 4373, which basically states that if the Palestinians initiate any international criminal court, uh, 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 international criminal court approach against uh, the state of Israel, that they will lose those funds. So the Palestinians can't seek recourse for the crimes committed against them, uh, because the United States they said if you if you do that, we're not going to give you money. And the Palestinians who are very cash strapped, oftentimes don't seek uh, international. Uh, justice because they they have priorities, which is to try and at least feed their people who are very poor at this point. Um, looking at these apartheid elements, so massive violations of human rights under military occupation, which is an apartheid element. Uh, in the West Bank, the Palestinians, as opposed to the Israelis, live under defense emergency regulation laws of 1945, where you can imprison, deport, destroy property, uh, and without charges or appeal. 
uh, confiscation of territory, as is the case with Area C. Uh, you see, uh, I, I discussed the ethnic cleansing in 1948, but there still continues to be a gradual ethnic cleansing. It's not as dramatic as what happened in 1948, but Palestinians are constantly losing their homes. They're constantly losing their land. And it's, on a, it's a systemic approach that happens on a daily basis. And so Jerusalem, for example, is a priority. Uh, the state of Israel makes it extremely difficult for folks in Jerusalem to maintain their uh, presence uh, in Jerusalem by creating a series of laws that deny them uh, the opportunity to uh, continue to stay there. Uh, there's also collective punishment. Uh, the state of Israel uh, has a problem with an organization called Hamas, which I mentioned to you is an organization that uh, believes in um, uh, violent resistance against the state of Israel in order to reach its objectives. But in the process of fighting with Hamas, what Israel does is it collectively punishes over 2 million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, uh, where 95% of the drinking water uh, is, un uh, the water there is undrinkable uh, where the, the strip only gets electricity uh, about four or five hours out of the day, uh, where uh, over 70% of the population does not receive the necessary caloric um, uh, daily intake, uh, where the majority of, of Palestinians suffer from um, uh, uh, psychological issues like PTSD as a result of the many onslaughts the state of Israel has, uh, where there is no um, system that caters to uh, mental illness over there, for example. Uh, and so life for the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip is actually much worse than it is in the West Bank. Uh, imposition of inhumane living conditions such as poverty. Uh, the Israeli military has crippled the Palestinian economy by uh, isolating the territories with, with settlements. These, these little dots are also uh, have their own separate highways. There are checkpoints. It's very difficult for a Palestinian to go from one place to the other. So if you're trying to get, let's just say, from here to Pilsen, uh, oftentimes you'd have to go through a checkpoint or, or a, a, a military uh, uh, or a settlement or what have you. You have to go around to, to accommodate uh, the uh, Israeli settlers. So life is very difficult to go from point A to point B. Uh, there have been many examples of, of women uh, how, who, who need to get to hospitals because they're, they're about to have... Uh, they go into labor and they often have their children at the checkpoint or often uh, suffer complications and die as a result. And so uh, it's just, just life having checkpoints like that, being in these prisons uh, is very difficult for the Palestinian uh, pal uh, population. Taking of water resources. If you're an Israeli settler, you get more water than a, than a Palestinian. Uh, there are roads that are separate for uh, Israelis uh, that Palestinians can't drive on or can't walk on, as is the case and uh, Hebron. Uh, Society-wise legalized discrimination in areas such as finance and housing, isolating the victim uh, geographically. You can see that the, I just mentioned the two-tier government, the military laws that govern the uh, Palestinians. When an Israeli settler attacks Palestinians or attacks Palestinian property and so forth, over 97% of those crimes that are committed against Palestinians are never prosecuted. Some of those crimes are murder. Uh, this is the, the depth in which we have such a problem uh, in uh, Israel and Palestine uh, today. Uh, inhumane suppression of rebellion against apartheid, which is oftentimes referred to as uh, uh, terrorism, uh, where Palestinians are oftentimes assassinated, their properties destroyed. If a Palestinian commits a violent act against the state of Israel, what the state of Israel will oftentimes do is come and blow up the Palestinians' home, um, which other family members uh, live in, which is called collective punishment, which is uh, illegal under international law. Uh, exploitation of labor. So in the West Bank settlements, it's the Palestinians that actually are the labor that build the West Bank settlements. And, and, and the reason why they do that is because they have no other way of sustaining themselves. If you look at you know, us as human beings, our priority is to do what? Is to, is to feed ourselves. And later when you have family, uh, you know, those, those are the things and kids, those are the things that become a priority. So some of these Palestinians, unfortunately, have to you know, swallow their pride and, and, and their integrity. And they have to go build those homes that, that are the symbols, those settlements that are the symbols of the oppression that they face on a daily basis, the oppression that their parents have faced on a daily basis, and the oppression that they're 
grandparents have faced on a daily basis. Uh, this here is a monumental uh, um, report here by Human Rights Watch. Uh, and it came out in April of 2020, 2021. It's made my life as a professor on this issue much, much easier because I've been saying this for years now. I've been saying that Israel is an apartheid state. And unfortunately, uh, you know, whether it's in uh, the, the different types of uh, um, platforms that I've had, um, I've uh, suffered the consequences, but the Human Rights Watch came out and it actually, it said that, that the, the, what Israel does in the occupied Palestinian territories constitutes apartheid. Not only that, but what the laws that are created inside of the state of Israel, where, the palace, where there are Palestinians, a 20% Palestinian population who are citizens of the state of Israel also face apartheid as well. It's just that the degrees of apartheid are different depending on where you are, whether you're in the West Bank, whether you're in Israel, uh, or whether you're, you're in the uh, Gaza Strip, uh, this uh, US organization uh, has come out and said that Israel practices apartheid, in Israel, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip. I have a whole report on it in that attachment. You can go there and you could read it, or you can go to the primary source, which is Human Rights Watch, and take a look at that. Beit Salam which is an Israeli organization, which by the way, has been referred to as anti-Semitic by some Israelis, which is by the state of Israel, which is, it's, but they're an Israeli Jewish organization inside of the state of Israel. And they came out and they said the same thing, uh, that the state of Israel practices apartheid, not only in the state of Israel, but in the West Bank, the Gaza Strip and uh, in East, uh, Jerusalem, and as you can see there, uh, it's as clear, clear as day where it states that the Israeli regime enacts in all the territory it controls, even Israeli sovereign territory, that the territory that is recognized by international, by the international community as sovereign Israel, as practicing apartheid. Uh, and the state of Israel often says that, that the Palestinians inside of Israel have rights, but uh, an, an Israeli organization has come out and has said that. Uh, finally, uh, in 2005, Palestinian civil society issued a call for a campaign of boycotts, divestments, and sanctions against the state of Israel until it complies with international law. Uh, these, this is one way uh, that uh, people uh, in Palestine and all over the world are allying with Palestinians by demanding that Israel conform to UN resolutions, uh, which is to end its occupation and colonization of Arab lands recognizing the fundamental rights of the Palestinian Arab citizens inside of Israel and respecting and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties as stipulated in resolution 194. So what BDS is, is it's an ask for the international community to support the Palestinian people as they look to their liberation. Thank you very much. Um, many things. That was a remarkably concise and clear presentation of a very complex history. You certainly laid to rest some of the prevailing misconceptions uh, that stifle reasonable discussion of Palestine and Israel in the United States, and you provided an overview that yields a much broader understanding of the issues. I wonder if we could turn to some questions. Perhaps I'll start with one um, to allow anybody who would like to come to the microphone to get there. And then um, some people uh, probably have formulated questions in the chat on Zoom. Um, I'm wondering I'm, if you could talk a bit about your own family's history and situated in the broader history you present? So we are, uh, you know, I, I think that we're, my family is actually one of the more fortunate ones because our, our villages still exist. Uh, and I have friends here tonight who, who, uh, whose villages are, are erased. I have one friend who's here tonight whose village is, there's a, a shopping center or a mall, a large mall built on. Uh, the village of his uh, ancestors. 
my uh, parents are both from what is referred to as the West Bank. My mother is from a uh, town called uh, Petunia, uh, which is uh, close to the city of Romolo. My father is from a village called Akava, which is just south of Nablus in the northern part of the West Bank. Uh, my father left Palestine uh, in the early 1950s. Uh, he went to uh, Brazil. And he lived in Brazil for, for a few years, uh, lived in other countries in, in South America, and then made his way up to Chicago in 1963. Uh, you know, he, he left with nothing. Uh, at that time, the, the West Bank was occupied by uh, the Jordanian government. Uh, and, and he came here and he worked really hard, uh, didn't have an education. Uh, worked very hard, would send money back to his father, to his brothers who supported Many of his brothers helped them become um, who, who they were today. Uh, was extremely family oriented from that aspect. Uh, came up to Chicago in 1963. Uh, my mother, who is, uh, she's, she's much younger than my dad. Uh, she came here with her mother in 1971. She was only uh, 16 years old when she came to the United States. And uh, she, a couple years later, she and my father met, so they actually met here in the United States. They got married. A few years later, they had us. Um, but uh, one thing about my parents, and I think the parents of a lot of Palestinians, and I've talked to friends of mine who are first-generation Americans, is the, the trauma that they carry. My father passed away in 2014, but there's something that, that you get to kind of think about your parents, especially after they pass, as more as people rather than your parents you get to sort of try to figure out why they made the decisions that they made who they were as individuals and so forth and i can tell you that my father carried a lot of trauma and a lot of that trauma had to do with what happened uh, in palestine my mother uh, the same way she carries a lot of trauma as well oftentimes i i you know when i talk to her sometimes she's listening to some of the older palestinian songs and so forth she dreams about going back and, and to her to her homeland where, where she grew up and, um, and it's, like a, it's like a different world for her now. And she carries that trauma around with her every single day. And just as many Palestinians carry that trauma and, and they actually pass it on to us without even realizing it because we carry it as well. Uh, we are the children of, of them. And so we, we obviously empathize with how they're feeling. And uh, this is an issue that's very important to me but I'm one of uh, millions, and I and I can tell you that that most Palestinians, the great majority of Palestinians that I know, even those who are uh, first generation in the United States, uh, have Palestine on their minds, and they want to see a, an end to the oppression. And being a part of this society, uh, my father worked as a, as a merchant. I've had the opportunity to work as a college professor. I've had a, uh, an opportunity to work uh, in places that my father never had access to. And so um, what I'm trying to do at this point is create those platforms and create those opportunities uh, to ensure that, uh, that the, the uh, trauma that my family has felt and the trauma that all Palestinians have felt uh, is one day rectified. And I want to see the liberation of the Palestinian people, and I will work towards that goal. That's you know, my primary objective and the objective of most Palestinians, even those who don't have the types of platforms that I have. And one of the things we've wanted to do with this series of talks is provide an opportunity for Palestinian voices to be heard in this country because it hasn't happened with enough frequency. Um, John, I think you've been keeping an eye on the chat. Um, there have been any questions that have come up? Yeah, thank you. I think we'd like to get to some questions about uh, the origins and activities of Uprising Theater. But uh, first, perhaps uh, a couple of questions that had come up regarding uh, the, if you will, the motivations of Israel. Uh, you have described, I think, the primary motivation on an ongoing basis so today as a, as a, as a demographic imperative. That is the, the, the overall goal of having a majority Jewish state. 
as a justification or a, a practical ground for implementing a Jewish state in full. Uh, but maybe you can elaborate on a couple of things that a couple of people have asked about. Uh, one person asked about uh, the role of what she referred to as identification with the aggressor, which I think she means uh, the extent to which Israel's actions are an outgrowth or even a motivation of imitating the treatment that they suffered uh, at the hands of Europe, Nazis and before. And then secondly, uh, well, maybe this is something you should, maybe it's not that, not that uh, mysterious, but what, what are the Israelis afraid of uh, that will happen if they give freedom and citizenship to the Palestinians? And the perspective was, well, are they better off in that case than having being surrounded by impoverished populations that don't have anything to, to hope for, any much, any any thing to lose? So maybe you can elaborate on sure. some of those thoughts and relate to your uh, your your uh, presentation. Sure, there, a lot of the uh, that the things we the decisions that you that we make in life are uh, sometimes driven by fear. There is no doubt about that. And uh, as I stated in the lecture, uh, the horrific experiences of uh, European Jewry as a result of the, it, it's not just the Holocaust, it's the centuries even prior to the Holocaust. If you go back all the way to the uh, Inquisitions or the much later, the uh, actually you go back to the Crusades because when the Crusaders would come into Palestine, they would often uh, oppress the Jewish communities that lived in Europe. But you have the, the Inquisitions, you have the pogroms that, that occurred uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, and then you, of course, had uh, the Holocaust. And it's, it's, it's a horrible experience. And many people fear that integration with Palestinians and so forth uh, is going to bring on some type of calamity uh, and that uh, in order to uh, ensure that this, this idea of never again, that sometimes you have to um, oppress other people. But here's my response to that. There are so many uh, Jews uh, in the United States, in Israel and around the world who are hand in hand with the Palestinian people, who support the Palestinian 100% in order for them to achieve freedom, dignity, justice, opportunity, uh, because of the fact that they know what oppression is like. And, and never again, not only is for uh, Jews, but it's also for Palestinians and all other human beings. And so I think that, um, you know, part of that motivation is, is I, I understand it and I, and I see it. trauma begets trauma, but you, you can make a choice. And the choice should be that uh, you know what oppression is like uh, and if you know what indignity is like, uh, you can identify it much easier and um, you should never tolerate it. Thank you. Well, maybe you can respond to some questions uh, we received uh, from people about what led you to found Uprising Theater and uh, what are some of your current projects? Sure. So I founded Uprising Theater in 2014. Uh, a few important things happened that year. I lost my class, as Priscilla said, at Columbia College. Uh, we, we conducted a, uh, a campaign that, that went international uh, and uh, we had support from around the world uh, and we got the class back. One thing that worried me though is how quickly uh, I lost my platform. And so the, the platform itself was so important to me. And there's, a, there's a habit about me to build platforms, whether it's on the academic level, the artistic level, or the political level. Uh, the idea is to build platforms and to, to create a voice. And that's why I emphasize how important these types of uh, talks are. Uh, we're in the heart of downtown Chicago talking about, the Palestin about Palestinian rights. We've come a long, long way. Uh, and so I was worried about the loss of my platform. We got the class back, but I was still worried. So I said, you know, what other platforms can I create that would allow the amplification of the Palestinian voice? Around that time, my father passed away. I inherited a, a building that I've been trying to put together for the last eight years to build a Palestinian uh, a theater uh, that uh, tells the story of the Palestinian people through art, which I think is very important, which I think is very effective. 
uh, is the most one of the most effective ways of telling the stories of people. It's much more effective for me to tell you about the struggles of a, of a Palestinian family uh, than to tell you that 10,000 Palestinians are, are suffering. If I tell you one story in a way that's effective, I could have a huge impact. And so that's why Uprising is there. Uprising is also designed to um, amplify the voices of other marginalized communities. So whether it's uh, Black Lives Matter, which has been, who have been staunch supporters of the Palestinians and their cause, uh, because oppression knows oppression, right? So, so uh, BLM has been staunch supporters, Latinx, uh, LGBTQ, uh, any marginalized group uh, to come and, and tell their stories because that makes them stronger and that makes us stronger. Uh, and we build a, a community of supporters that way. And so the two projects, the two main projects that we're working on is one project is uh, a one woman show by uh, the co-artistic director of Uprising Theater, Marin Rosenberg, who's a very talented artist, a very talented writer, and one of my very best friends. Uh, and she's uh, uh, you know, a staunch supporter of this initiative and she's a, a very st a strong part of the initiative. She went to Palestine, lived in the Palestinian refugee camp for three years because as a Jewish American woman, she realized, she said, you know, what I heard them tell me on birthright is questionable. What I heard, uh, what I've been hearing about Palestinians and the way that they've been dehumanized, uh, I have questions about that. So what does Marin do with Marin being Marin? She, won't, she goes to, to Palestine, bypasses all that birthright stuff or what have you, and lands in the heart of uh, Bethlehem in a Palestinian Haida refugee camp. Uh, and she stayed there uh, for approximately three years. And she realized that in the same way that African-Americans in this country have been dehumanized for 400 years with their humanity extracted from them, uh, in the same way that Jews were dehumanized in Europe for centuries, so too are the Palestinians today being dehumanized by not only the state of Israel, but the rest of the world. And that's, um, that's when... Uh, we met, we met a couple of years later and she came on uh, to Uprising uh, and is now the co-artistic director. The second project we're working on is I've been uh, trying to renovate a building uh, that I own uh, in Logan Square that is going to serve as the home of Uprising Theater. We have a, a couple of promising leads as far as uh, 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 raising the funds. We have some more promising than, than it's been in the last few years. And I mentioned a little bit of that to you, Priscilla. Um, yes. I'm not gonna talk about that uh, until it actually uh, happens, but uh, the idea is to create, to actually have a home for uh, the theater, uh, which would serve as a, um, a place where a Palestinian artists can come and tell their stories along with uh, other uh, marginalized communities and allies of the Palestinian cause. Well, we are at our time or past it. We do have, we, we have an audience hanging on and maybe uh, if people want to, uh, to, to it's acceptable to ask, uh, ask a couple more of the questions that have appeared or should we just call it a day? So, well, well, briefly, could you provide an insight into the claim that the Palestinians were responsible for the failure of the Oslo Agreement? That would have to be very brief because that's something that, that comes up. And then, you know, very briefly, in light of your experience, what can, what can each of us do in, in connection with U.S. policy? We had a discussion of that before about advocacy, and that's probably something that can be left for another time primarily, but maybe you had a couple of final thoughts on that. Thank you. So regarding the Oslo Accords and the failure of the Oslo Accords, the Oslo Accords failed because Israel was um, negotiating um, and at the same time, uh, building settlements. And so the, an example of that is in 1993, there are about 130 to 150,000 uh, Israeli settlers. Today, uh, there are approximately 630,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. You can't sit there and, and negotiate over the pie while you keep taking slices and eating from it. It, it, that's just, it's, it's not done in good faith and, it, and it's illogical. Uh, but on a larger 
Uh, no, the idea of splitting the country has been tried to, or, or recommended for a long time. It's never worked. The area is tiny. Um, as I mentioned to you, it's a small area. Uh, the Palestinians, the majority of the Palestinians who, uh, who aren't even mentioned in the two-state paradigm are, uh, are from the areas that they were ethnically cleansed from from 1948. They have a right to return. And so why not have a state that recognizes the rights of everybody who lives there because it's already a single state and it's just a matter of the levels of oppression that the Palestinians suffer uh, based on where they are uh, in uh, the country. I think probably we need to close. Um, I know you're all with me in expressing deep appreciation to Professor Shahadi for being with us this evening, for um, his wonderfully succinct and lucid distillation of a very complex history and situation. Thank you to all participants for joining us as we pursue this search for peace and justice in Palestine, Israel. And I wish you good night, good health and good and safe travels. Thank <laughs> you.